Uh, she's uh, Browning human fish, non non game mammal biologist. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you, guys. I can't believe that this many people are here. That everybody likes Wolverines, so I won't uh, I won't hesitate too much because I'm going to give you like a little plug here at the beginning before we talk about Wolverines, uh, and then we'll get into some Wolverine ecology and some survey work that we did and the results that we got uh, in the in a couple of different survey periods. So. First, I, I have to give you like a caveat that uh, I've given this presentation before and it was for an Autobahn group. So I had to prove to them that I was a bird nerd and a couple people in here already know that. Uh, but so my career started as an undergraduate. I'm, I'm originally from Wisconsin, not from uh, Wyoming, but I've lived here for going on 18 years now. Um, but I got my start um, at University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, and all of my early research work that I got to do as a young technician was on birds, because I love birds uh, ever since I was five years old. So, so I started by doing work on the species that you see up here. So there's white birds and blackbirds, and, and oh, I can't use the pointer on the TV. Uh, in the, the picture with the eggs, there's one egg that's out of place there. That's a cowbird egg in a red-winged blackbird nest. So um, I worked on <coughs> cowbird parasitism study. And then worked on uh, balloons and did some volunteer work with some researchers on a black turn. That's this little bird down here in the corner. And that's an old picture of me wrangling a loon chick there on the back of the truck uh, for that study. And if any one of you have ever been in my office or, um, uh, or my house, you'll see loon stuff everywhere. They're my favorite bird from having worked on them on that study. Um, and then I went to graduate school. Um, again, I stayed in Wisconsin, and this time I went to University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And that's when I started working on some mammal stuff. So my master's thesis was looking at white-tailed deer, um, which are very, very common in the Midwest, and some of the damage that they can do when their numbers are too high. On the two plants on either corner of that screen, um, the one on this side is called weatherleaf, and the one over there is probably more familiar to some people. It's called trillium. Um, they're both plants that have um, like a life history or biology that uh, basically makes them really susceptible to getting eaten by deer. Um, and, and then their, their population, the plant population suffers. So we did some exposure studies. You can see these, these cages here are protecting some of the plants. And then in the foreground, you can see some blue, um, blue flags. And those are plots to compare the ones that are exposed for deer to eat and the ones inside. And that, this is just like a, this is a precursor to what I'm gonna to talk to you about. That's the very first camera trap that I ever set with a 35 millimeter camera. That's how old I am. Um, but uh, now everything's digital and you get instant gratification. I had to take the film to Walgreens and develop it and see what I got. But that's the first picture. You can see those blue flags that deer are standing right in the middle of that plot. Um, basically eating the plants that I'm studying, and that was the whole point. So I was really happy when I got that picture. But that kind of got me uh, like into this idea of cam using cameras to survey animals instead of having to directly lay eyes on them, um, especially our more aloof species like wolverines. So these are all the various places I did work on wildlife in the state of Wisconsin um, in, in my homeland before I came here. Um, and in 2005, I got a job right out of graduate school with uh, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And I first worked in Gillette. And then I got to study all of these other species and do work on all these other species. Um, but mostly what I did was, um, I was called a, what's called a regional wildlife biologist. So the main species that you focus on in those positions are big game animals and, and basically anything that has a hunting license and the management of those species. So deer, antelope, elk, um, upland game birds, um, things like that, uh, bears. But I did get an opportunity to kind of like tinker in my regions, first in Gillette and then here in Casper, with some non-game stuff um, and like helping out our non-game section before I actually worked for it. And then uh, just a year and a half ago, I got the opportunity to, to take a position in our non-game section. So now, I'm our statewide non-game mammal biologist, and I study species like this that you don't 
get a license for and that we don't hunt. So um, that's just a smattering of the species that we have studied in recent years. Um, and if you want, I can go through ID them, but the one up in the upper right hand corner is the one that we'll talk about um, here just shortly. So some people don't even know that, um, that the Game and Fish Department has a non-game section because you're used to seeing um, or interacting with our regional biologists, my old job, um, or our law enforcement folks, our game wardens and things like that. Those are the people that you end up seeing and hearing from in the field. Um, our non-game section is pretty small, um, even though it has statewide coverage. So there is a supervisor over me, and then myself, and then our non-game bird biologist that studies the bird side of things. And then we have a suite of, of biologists that work underneath us. And then we hire some summer technicians depending on what the workload is and depending on what species we're studying. But the whole reason that we even exist, uh, and some people ask, like, what's the point? Like, what do you do if you don't manage game species? Uh, you know, like, what's the point of, of managing or having an interest or, or collecting information on non-game species? And some of those reasons are up here. The most important or kind of technical one is that it's written in state statute that we manage all wildlife species in one way, not just game, game species. And non-game species are more likely to be threatened or endangered, and, and therefore they have the most potential to be listed as um, endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, non-game species uh, a lot of times can be an indicator of species, so they can kind of take, like, understanding what's going on with their populations can give you a temperature, I guess, of, of what's going on in certain ecosystems. Systems and, and give you information about the entire plant community and ecosystem. Uh, and they, of course, just um, in how numerous they are, they, they represent a tremendous diversity in our state and the, and the heritage that goes along with that. Um, so, so again, us, uh, our members in the non-game section have statewide responsibility. We're not just, um, you know, like assigned to a certain area of the state like other biologists. Um, as a mammal biologist, there are 83 non-game mammals in the state of Wyoming. So clearly when there's just one of me and, uh, and a couple other people helping me out, um, we can't study all of those at the same time. That, that would be crazy. Uh, so what we tend to do is focus on those threatened and endangered species and getting a better understanding of those, trying to uh, either keep them from being listed as threatened or endangered, if, um, if they're approaching that, uh, or if they're already listed federally, trying to help recover those populations and working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So the way that we do that, a lot of these species we don't have a lot of comprehensive information on, so we do a lot of inventories, we look at their distribution and range, and then we kind of recheck that on a cycle, and that those pulses of collecting information on those species gives us trends over time. So we know, uh, we might not know how many of something there are in the state, but we can, we can tell if their populations are expanding or are contracting, and then we can look at and compare, like if they're contracting out of this area, what's making them disappear? What parts of the habitat or what threats are there available or that are present on the landscape that, that might be influencing their numbers and what can we do to mitigate that and maybe correct that and fix it. Um, so, so that is the majority of the work that I do now. Um, there's, again, like I said, we have these recovery plans that we implement for threatened and endangered species that kind of gives us a roadmap for how to get those species out of the, that state of being threatened or endangered. Um, and we try to follow those and quantify things and, um, and get those species off the endangered species list if we can. Uh, and that involves, all of these involve a lot of multi-agency collaboration. So, um, so I end up working quite a bit more in this job than before with a lot of other agencies. Um, and there was some, I did some of that in, the, in my previous position, but it's a lot of working with the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, with the Forest Service, with the parks um, on the western part of the state, uh, with NGOs that have interest in recovering or um, conserving species, um, and then lots of partnering with researchers. So uh, I do a lot of work with university and with the college here and research that goes on and collaborating with, uh, with those folks. A lot of times if I don't have time to study a species or collect information on it because of the other things that uh, 
other species I'm working on. There might be a student that wants to do a graduate or a PhD, like a PhD project, um, something, and then we can collaborate with them and they can help us and we can help them. Um, we can give them funding to kind of help them along uh, and it becomes like a, a great partnership uh, doing, doing work like that. Okay, um, one more thing before we launch into Wolverine. So these are the focal species that we've been working on in the non-game section lately. Um, a few of them we always work on because they're those ones that we're recovering or we're working on recovery. So black footed parrot is one of those. Um, it's, a, it's a listed species, it exists in the state and we have some goals that we want to achieve in the state that we keep working towards with ferrets. Uh, and that's another talk, I love talking about ferrets. Um, bat species, there are 18 of those 82 species are bats in, uh, in Wyoming. So that's like over 20% of the non-game mammals in the state are bats. And uh, several of them are either listed or being petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act right now. So we do annual work on them. Preble's meadow jumping mouse, which was, it's down here on the bottom of the like chalk of the ground stripe down its back. Um, that's a threatened species that we have in Wyoming that we are working on recovering. And then these other species are those ones that I was talking about that we kind of do on a rotating basis. So we don't study them every year. Uh, we just finished prairie dogs in the year before that. We finished with ficus surveys. This summer and fall, we'll be working on swift fox surveys. And then of course we just finished with Wolverine and that's the one that we'll talk about now. So thank you for tolerating my spiel and, and we'll get into it. So the first thing we'll talk about is some life history and ecology of Wolverines. And then like once once we have a little understanding of, of how they operate, it'll, it'll help you understand the reasons why we uh, use the survey methods that we use. And then we'll talk about some of the results that we've had so far. Um, which, are, which are pretty cool. Okay, Wolverine life history. And by the way, uh, when this is done, if anyone wants to come up, we have a Wolverine pelt here. I know there's a taxidermy mount behind the glass over there, but if you want to look at one up close, there's a pelt here. There's a, this is a replica, it's made out of resin, but this is a Wolverine skull. And then I have a badger skull here for comparison if people want to come up and peek and I can show you some of the, some of the differences on there. Uh, but wolverines, and these are both members of the same family, the Mustelid family. Wolverines are, you'll see a lot of places that say they're the largest member of the Mustelid family. There's actually, in the Mustelid or Lizzo family, there's a, there's a species of otter that's really big and actually physically bigger than, in some cases, the males are bigger than wolverines. Uh, but in North America, wolverines are the largest uh, in the Lizzo family. Females are a little bit smaller than males. Males are bigger. Um, and uh, across the board, they have these huge feet with semi-retractable claws. So the big feet help them get around in deep snow in the winter. They don't hibernate. They eat their way through winter, literally. Um, so, uh, so those big feet help them get around in habitats with deep snow that other species that don't hibernate have difficulty in. So it gives them an advantage and gives them access to habitats that uh, things like mountain lions um, and uh, wolves don't have access to because they're not built to get through that deep snow. The only other species that might be out on the landscape in some places where you would find wolverines in the winter would be lynx. Again, they have huge feet. They can get across the snow really efficiently. They kind of have different um, niches uh, that, that they focus on for food, but I'm sure where they exist in the same place, there's probably a little bit of competition there. Um, they have powerful jaws, um, and there's parts of their skull that, that show that. Um, I might as well lie, I usually don't have the skull with me, but um, this, this ridge on the back of the skull is a spot where more, um, more tendon and more muscle attach. You'll see it's not present on the badger skull at all, even though you know these guys are powerful too and have some pretty strong jaws. Wolverine, much stronger. They have this extra muscle that attaches to this sagittal ridge on the back uh, of, their, uh, of their skull. And then all the Stellas have this weird thing that will always let you know that it's something in the weasel family where these back molars are turned at a 90 degree angle. I don't know if you can see that. It is really like weird. Yeah, yeah, it's very odd, but you can come up and peek at that later if you want to. Um, 
So they have powerful jaws, and then they have, most of them have this chocolatey coloring with the light, we call it an apron, that light color around the, um, their back or their sides. And um, that can be variable between individuals, and you'll see in some pictures that are coming up, some of them have white feet, they have different markings on their, uh, on their neck and throat. Some of them have a darker face, some of them have a lighter face, but all of them kind of have that general chocolatey color um, and, and look kind of like a, cr a cross between like a skunk and a bear, essentially. Oh, it's going to slide, he's slippery. He's trying, trying to escape, yes, I hope not. <laughs> We're all in trouble if that is true. <laughs> uh, so, their distribution of these are, uh, the map on the right is like the North Pole looking straight down. So. They have circumpolar distribution. They don't just exist in North America. They exist all the way uh, around the globe at these higher elevations. And then you can see the range map. Hopefully that's showing up OK. It's a little bit light in color. But um, the darker color pink is their current range. And you can see where their historic range used to be. And you can see that, the, that Wyoming is at the very south end of this extension that comes down the, the Rockies. Um, and used to come further, but uh, right now is kind of protracted and ends here essentially in Wyoming. Um, so they were nearly eliminated from the continental United States um, in er earlier times due to um, overtrapping and they were considered like a nuisance. Um, but, uh, but since trapping has been controlled and in some cases eliminated in some states, they've been slowly recolonizing um, the continental US since the 1930s. So um, behavior wise, uh, they're mostly solitary and nocturnal. These are things like, keep these in the back of your head because some of these things are going to help you understand why we survey them the way that we do. So they're very solitary, they're nocturnal, they have very big home ranges. So that's, that's a huge range, 20 to 150 square miles. It depends on the resources that they have available. And also females have smaller home ranges, males have a large home range that encompasses several female home ranges. So that's why it extends out to that bigger size. Um, they like boreal or alpine forests. So down here at the lower end, of, like lower latitudes, you'll find them at these higher elevations. Once you get up into Canada and the Arctic where things kind of flatten out and become more tundra-like, um, you find them just in boreal forests. It doesn't have to necessarily be at higher elevations. Um, but here, in the summertime, they will go up in elevation in the summer, and as the snow covers everything and extends uh, down to lower elevations, and as they need to search more for food, they'll come down to lower elevations. And that's when we start to get sightings from people where wolverines are occupying some of the same spaces that, that people are occupying. Um, but they require large areas um, to themselves with very little or no human disturbance. Um, so that's, of course, one of the concerns that we have with, with more people using sort of these mid-elevations, especially in the winter time. Is that a fence post, Heather? A fence post? Oh, that is Or just deadfall? I think that's a deadfall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although, I mean, Brian, I do have a video from last week from somebody in Thermopolis that had to trail a camera out and caught uh, footage of a wolverine at, um, like, just south of New Orleans. Um, on the Bighorn River, like wow. way, way down, way, way down. Um, so they can show up literally anywhere, but they tend to like those higher elevations. And again, like I said, in wintertime, they start to kind of ooze down looking for food. Um, speaking of food, they are opportunistic eaters. So they don't just eat meat. They're not just solely a carnivore. They will eat literally anything that they have access to. So in the summertime, that might be berries, seeds, roots, uh, eggs out of nests, small mammals that they can quick um, ambush and, and grab onto. They can and will ambush larger prey. Um, again, the snow is to their advantage there. They can, they can run on top of that snow. Um, ungulates, you know, elk, deer um, that are trying to escape them in deep snow get stuck and slow down. And that is an opportunity for a wolverine to, uh, to get a meal. If they get something that big, they will cache it under the snow, they'll bury it, they'll come back to it over and over and over again until every last bit is gone. If they don't kill it themselves, like this winter, we, I certainly have a lot of uh, mortality from the wintertime uh, with 
with deer and antelope and things like that, not being able to survive the winter that we've had, they will take advantage of those um, mortalities and scavenge on those. Again, they'll cache them under the snow and come back to them over and over again. So, um, so yeah, highlighted on this slide and on the next slide, you'll see references to snow. Um, more about their ecology. Um, their mating season is basically uh, starting next month through the summer. Um, they have this weird, everything in the weasel or muscala family has these two strange um, reproductive adaptations. Um, delayed ovulation is, this maybe is in the weeds more than anybody cares to know. Uh, a female will not ovulate unless she is mated with. So uh, for our folks that have tried to raise ferrets in captivity, that makes captive um, like uh, AI, uh, artificial insemination, very hard. So, <laughs> um, so that is a, that's just kind of a characteristic of everything in the weasel family. And then once that egg is fertilized, it actually doesn't implant and start growing into uh, an offspring until later. It kind of is just kind of there in limbo for a couple of months before it implants. Um, they, their den sites, at least in this part of the world, are again at high elevation. When you get further up into Canada towards the Arctic, that's not necessarily true. Um, but they do like to build den sites under logs and boulders, and at this time of year, when they're giving birth to kids, they will use snow dens a lot. And if they're disturbed, they will just bail out of one snow den, take their kits, and create another one. Uh, so again, they have uh, kids uh, are born right now in between February and March. Actually, they probably are here on the ground. Um, they'll emerge from those dens and start following their mother around in May or so, early June. Uh, and they're dependent on their on their mother, which is kind of similar to um, black bears, for a couple of years before they're fully mature. And then they'll disperse, uh, and then she'll have the opportunity again to breed. Um, you know, every two to three years. But that creates the slow reproduction rate. Um, and that's another component of why we don't see tons of them or they don't replace themselves very quickly on the landscape because they, they give their young a lot of like, uh, care before, uh, before they are independent and go off on their own. Some population level threats we already talked about. The two on the top that aren't highlighted are kind of historic reasons that the, that wolverine numbers declined. So again, that unregulated trapping uh, and just having like a bad reputation of, um, you know, getting into people's uh, livestock and things like that. We still have instances of that here and there, but not nearly as much as uh, other species that are more numerous on the landscape in Wyoming. Um, but occasionally it does happen. Um, the main threats at a population scale to wolverine numbers are things like habitat loss. So um, logging, wild, the huge wildfires that we've had are especially um, a big deal. Um, there were some huge wildfires in their, um, in their range in the Cascades in, in Washington in recent years that destroyed a lot of wolverine habitat. Uh, and then those things that fragment habitat, so roads, housing developments, things like that, that kind of take those big contiguous pieces of habitat that they prefer and chunk it into smaller bits and cause disturbances that will make the that'll make wolverine less likely to utilize those areas. Um, winter recreation is something that's on our radar recently as, as having an influence on on wolverine's uh, ability to use the landscape where we have especially since COVID we have more and more people wanting to be in the backcountry in the winter um, you have like more popularity of things like teleskiing, uh, snow machining, and things like that that cause disturbances in what would otherwise be pretty quiet country um, in the winter time. Just more and more human use. And then climate change, and this year is a terrible example of that, but uh, in some years where we have very dry winters and not a lot of that snowpack, that means that Wolverine have to go out where there's not that advantage for them to, you know, to skate across the snow uh, efficiently compared to other predators. And then they have to use the same landscape that things like mountain lions and wolves are using and, and compete with them for food. All right, um, their management status. I think we, we referenced earlier 
um, how we like to pay attention to animals that ha have been petitioned or are listed as endangered species. So Wolverine were petitioned in 1994 and again in 2000. I just completed another review for the Fish and Wildlife Service giving them all of the data that we're going to talk about so that they can use that. Um, but the, in both of these cases, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that listing the species was not warranted. And the main reason was that we don't have a lot, at least at that point in time, we did not have very much good information and continuous in information across their whole range in the continental U.S. to know if they're such a secretive animal. We don't know, like, where are they? Do we have good data? Do we have consistent information? So they're, they're hard to detect. They exist at low densities, and we just didn't have a lot of good information. So the Fish and Wildlife Service said no. Like, until we get better information, we can't, uh, we're not going to put this animal on the endangered species list, not knowing more. So it identified this need that we need, we need to study the species more and have a better understanding of where they are and how many there are in order to make good management decisions about them. So with that, a whole bunch of agencies, again, I was talking about how we cooperate with other agencies on this stuff, formed a big cooperative group to monitor wolverines using the exact same study format in multiple states instead of every state doing their own thing in various years with different methods. Everybody agreed we're gonna use the same methods and we're gonna do it all at the same time in all of the states, uh, which, which gives you this huge, really great, robust data set. Um, so that um, was one of the decisions that was made and, and the point uh, with this group, it's, it's called the Forest Carnivore Subcommittee of the Western um, Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Um, also decided these other thing, things at the bottom, their goals. So, um, and Wyoming is, is a member of that group. So our goals are to promote the long-term population viability of wolverines, to support their expansion into suitable habitat if their populations do start to grow. Um, and to manage wolverines as a protected species, not as a fur bearer. So um, a couple of states, um, not including Wyoming, uh, but Montana, <coughs> excuse me, and Idaho still have wolverines listed as a fur bearer. Um, they don't have seasons that have been open for a long time, but they still haven't changed the designation of wolverines from a fur bearer to a protected species in a couple of states. So, so our hope is, is to, to get that across the board. Um, if they were ever, if their populations ever grew enough to, to the point where we thought they could, um, they could withstand a bit of harvest from trappers, then maybe we would change that. But for now, we'd like them to be a protected species. And they are in Wyoming right now. So this slide are all of the logos of all of the Western states that, and, and entities that are participating all together and cooperating on this project. So, this is the overarching agency that I was talking about, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. You can see all the badges and logos for all of the other Western states that are participating now. And then these two logos here are um, a company that does, uh, out of University of Montana, Speed Goat. They do a lot of data analysis for, um, on wildlife, um, and they're handling this huge, giant data set from all of these states. Um, and then the Genomic Center is doing some of our DNA work. They're based out of Missoula, and they're, a, they're kind of a federal entity with the, uh, they're like a branch of the Forest Service. All right, so with all of that in mind, and, and everyone decides we are going to do all of this together all at the same time, how do we study this species that is elusive, lives in dense forest, high elevation, pretty rugged country, what are, how are we going to do this? And the solution that everyone came up with was camera trap occupancy surveys. So this is like, again, a multi-state cooperative monitoring to document the species across the whole West, not just one state. And then we're going to repeat those surveys. Like I was telling you, those trend surveys, we can't necessarily study the same species every single year. So we all agree we're going to do this on a five-year rotating basis all together. So how do we come up with where we survey these, uh, these tricky hidden species? First, you, uh, we have research from other places that lets us know what constitutes the, the things in habitat that, 
that wolverines like so we can map their suitable habitat across the whole list and see where we have the best habitat versus not very good wolverine habitat at all. So that kind of narrows things down. Then we place a grid over the top of that and you'll, there'll be a, a slide coming up that kind of shows you the grid cells. Um, and those are like overlaid over that suitable habitat. And each one of those grids is meant to represent one of those smaller female sized home ranges. So you overlay that grid and then we don't have the time or the resources of the personnel to put a camera on every single one of those. So we take a random sample of them um, and make sure that it's a big enough sample size that it gives us the information that we want. And then we put these trail cameras out. Um, if you just were to stick a trail camera out and hope for a random animal to pass in front of it, you probably wouldn't get a lot of results. So we cheat uh, and we kind of um, take a take a beat from trackers and we put bait or lure out in front of the cameras to attract wolverines and it turns out lots of other things <laughs> into the front of the camera to have their picture taken. Um, luckily, like I said, in the winter time, in the, some of these habitats, a lot of species are hibernating or they can't access that country. That is the time period when we are trying to find wolverines. So we put these out in the winter time. Um, we do still get hits from other species and we'll, I'll show you some pictures of those. And then just to, like, since we're putting all this effort in, we're sending <coughs> wildlife technicians backpacking and skiing and snow machining and snowshoeing into this rugged country to set all this stuff up. We also added, well, let's try to get some DNA um, while we're out there. So we make this belt, essentially, that goes around the tree that has bait in it. And when that wolverine has to climb up the tree, there are literally stiff metal gun brushes like that you clean your firearms with sticking out of that that grab pieces of hair and then we can go collect those pieces of hair and send them to the genomic center. So all kinds of fun, tricky, it sounds like a wild e. coyote kind of a setup, but, but it turns out that it worked pretty good. So um, these are three of our crew members from the first study in 2016 and 17 crossing Jackson Lake uh, to go to, uh, check out my camera trap site. So again, we place these out in the fall. We leave them out all winter and then we pick them up and then we, we have a camera with a memory card full of pictures. And then we get to sit and we'll get literally hundreds of thousands of pictures to sort through what we have on the camera. And if we have a Wolverine at this site or this site or this site. So um, we had two different kinds of camera trap sites. Um, some of them are easier to get to in the winter time. So we put bait, like actual pieces of meat out there. And then we have uh, biologists go out and check them every X number of weeks and take the bare bone of a deer leg from a roadkill off the tree and put a new one up um, to keep uh, attracting animals all winter. The, some of our sites you cannot get to safely in the winter time, so they were set in the fall with lure uh, that is actually dispensed. It's almost like one of those plugins that like, like every periodic, like you set it on a timer it squirts out this very smelly, skunky um, um, oil that then lands on a piece of bone that you've tied underneath it. And, uh, and it sends out like a lovely smell. It doesn't give them any food reward when they get there, but if they can smell it and they come into it. Um, and you can leave it out the whole winter. Um, so those camera images and the hair samples were what we got in, in return. And a lot of, um, of individuals on cameras and a whole lot of other species on those cameras too to sort through. So this is what all of that that I just explained to you looks like um, and it, hopefully these are clear enough. This is someone else's setup in other states. Um, they have trappers that give them beavers. This is a beaver tail. This is a carcass of a beaver with the hide removed um, and they donate these and these get hung up in the tree with the camera facing them. This is the lure setup, so you see the bone hanging, and there's this box up above that squirts um, skunky, stinky stuff on it. Um, and then just some images of what our cameras, our comics cameras look like. Um, those are the gun brushes. They're, they're literally put on like a corrugated plastic belt, and you'll see it in a bunch of images coming up. That's put below so that the Wolverine has to climb up over it and, and hopefully get hair stuck on it. So you can see that belt around the bottom of that tree. Um, and a carcass up there, and that one actually has a yellow sponge above it that has some of that lure and bait uh, on both, and that's actually not a wolverine at the bottom, that's a relative, that's a pine marten in that picture. 
but it shows you kind of how you set the camera up to point at it in the pictures that it takes. So here's some results with some little grades on it. Yeah, so um, this is what we look for out of, uh, oh my gosh, um, 400,000 images that we got in our, in our last bunch of surveys. There's lots of magpies that really <laughs> like to hang out and pick at those carcasses. Uh, so we have lots of pictures of magpies and Stellar's jays and uh, Clark's nutcrackers and some other species. But uh, all of us took turns and shared in the pain of going through all the pictures of birds, 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 birds. Oh, like, okay, cool. Now we're, now we're in business. We got a Wolverine. So, um, so we got uh, some hits on some cameras and some not. But that's, these are the images that we're looking for. Again, you can see that belt with the gun brushes sticking out. You can see that Wolverine is right on top of that gun brush <laughs> belt trying to get up to the, the food reward that's up at the top. And these are what the grids look like. And I hope that you can see that it's kind of small, but so, so we did these initially, this, these surveys in 2016 and 17 across that winter. And then we repeated them again in uh, 2020 and, or 2020 and 2021. Um, and so I'll show you some differences, but these are the initial results from the very first study. So in Wyoming, all of the dark colored squares are, are the sites that got a camera and bait and all that good stuff. The ones that are colored in dark green are the ones where we actually got a wolverine on the camera. Um, and then the light green ones in there are in incidental reports from the public that were confirmed. So we added those in because that gives us information in some of those grid cells where we didn't necessarily have that information before. Someone from the public saw it, took a picture or gave us um, a good picture of tracks where we're like, yep, that's a Wolverine, we, we counted it in this data set. And you can see the states that participated in this first round. So we had Washington, uh, Idaho, Montana, um, and, and us here in Wyoming in that first round in that forest carnivore group. So six out of 51 cameras that were set, not a very high return rate, but again, these are elusive critters. They have huge home ranges. They, they're just not at a very high density on the landscape to begin with. So we were happy having no data to start here was pretty great. And then um, other states had higher occupancy rates. So, so we're part of this lower Yellowstone group and you can see our occupancy rate was 0.12 out of, so you're just taking six divided by 51. Um, a little bit higher occupancy rate in like Idaho, Montana, um, and then um, I, I don't think I have separate data for the Cascades in Washington, but you can see like as you get into some more rugged country in Idaho and, and into Montana and the bigger parts of the Rockies, you start to get higher incidences of, of wolverines in those places. For the genetic stuff, um, it's, it's hard to get really good hair samples that survive the winter. So the sites where we have bait, we have better success at getting that hair collected partly through the winter before the cells uh, at the root of the hairs that are collected becomes basically useless for the genomics lab. So, um, but we had 19 hair samples total from that first bunch that were ID positive as Wolverine, which is cool. We get other stuff on there. Um, deer from the bait, you get deer hair stuff on it, or other species that have crawled over it, lots of pine marten. Um, and depending on the quality of the hair or of the hair sample and the, uh, the cells on the root, um, sometimes the lab can ID it down to not just it's a wolverine hair, but it's this individual or that individual. Um, so they were able to do that with four samples and found two males and two females. And one of those, very cool, was the southernmost female documented in the continental United States. And that was here in Wyoming, in the Wyoming, or in the Wind River Range. It's that green square down at the bottom. So that was pretty cool. Uh, we were pretty happy about that. And because of that, all of a sudden, when we did the next round, this more, more recent round of surveys, we had other states that were like, maybe we should participate too. Uh, so all of a sudden, we have other states that want to play, uh, which is great. So uh, Colorado, um, you can see like, so the, again, these are the grid cells. I'm sorry, this is zoomed out to include everybody. Um, but the dark blue are um, 
are the cells that were, were sampled across the area. So ours were the same uh, this last round, and then we added California. Um, Nevada only had a few, so they didn't set any. Utah set some, and, uh, and Colorado and Oregon, they're part of the Cascades they participated too. So all of a sudden we had more folks. Um, uh, the note there that Colorado had 16 cells is because I gave this talk to Colorado folks and I thought they would want to know. Um, but it was just nice to see that expansion and like more participation range-wide this time. So results from, uh, from this last time. Remember we had six last time, this time we had 15. So uh, we're, getting, we're either getting better at putting the bait out and getting the setup right or we have more wolverines or maybe a little bit of each, probably a little bit of each. We had 10 new detection sites compared to the last time. Um, we had, again, I told you about processing all of these images. We had almost 5,000 images of wolverines um, on those cameras, but the cameras are set to take a burst of several pictures when they get motion in front of them. So that doesn't mean we had nine or 5,000 wolverines. It means we have a lot of pictures of the same wolverine sitting there for minutes, half hours, hours, like <laughs> wrestling with the bait, uh, and it's kind of entertaining. So um, we we still don't have any detections in the bighorns. I want to stress, like when we do surveys like this, where we don't get to see everything, that absence of detection doesn't mean there's not wolverines there. It just means that one didn't walk in front of the cameras that we put out. Um, and that being said, I, I had mentioned uh, earlier that we have video from a couple weeks ago of one in Moreland that probably lives in the Bighorns most of the time, uh, which is very close by. Um, but on our cameras this last round, we didn't get any detections there. We added the snowy range this last time. Um, so we have a few more uh, camera trap sites down there at where we had zero before. No detections down there, but uh, again, we just have a handful of survey sites down there. We'll probably expand that in the future to see if we get any hits. Um, again, we have this, this map compared to that map has those confirmed sightings from the public added to it, so you'll see more dots up there. Um, if you haven't seen um, and want to, you can search YouTube. Uh, last winter there were some folks doing like a winter eco tour of Yellowstone, and there was, uh, there was a wolverine on the road right in front of them, just hanging out, uh, and they got awesome footage of it. And then some uh, father is like interviewing his, it was during spring break, his eight year old, he's like, what is that? And she was like, oh, like, like, yeah. And I was just like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she was like, whatever. So, <laughs> but really cool footage. Um, and we get lots more sightings, it seems like, every year, um, especially in the greater Yellowstone area. So um, if you ever see one, Remember that you have a camera in your back pocket usually and try to get pictures or video. But um, so those were added. All of this information then is what goes to the Fish and Wildlife Service and gives them more information range wide and helps them make those difficult decisions about is the species in peril? Um, does it need to be protected by the Endangered Species Act? Do we need to have some sort of recovery program for it or not? Um, it seems like the more we look for wolverines in Wyoming anyways, the more we find, which I think is really cool. I don't want that species to be listed, and I'm happy that it is. seems to be flourishing here. So um, again, we got better at our setup and got better DNA samples. So we got 39 hair samples this last time. They're not even finished analyzing them right now at the genomics lab. They've just... Um, They've just worked them down to species and not to individual yet. Um, but what we have, um, we've got several individuals already identified. We're just waiting for them to finish up. Um, it just takes a long time for those, those processes to run. And then we can see, do we have the same individuals on some of these cameras that we had the last time, those four that we identified down to individual and see if they're they're still out there and they're still hitting the cameras and still in their original home ranges. So let's see if we can make this work. Please work, please work, please work. There we go. So this is like a bunch of those camera images stitched together. Um, and this was probably our most <laughs> utilized camera trap. <laughs> but you can see, again, they have those retractable claws. So they're kind 
of good at climbing, but not great at climbing. Uh, those retractable claws are better for grabbing prey than they are for climbing trees, but they can do it when they want to. And you can see that Wolverine is all over the gum brushes, giving us hair samples. And there's a magpie getting chased away. <laughs> he is just waiting for a meal. Um, you can see this one's got white feet. Um, and then in a minute, there will be one with not white feet. They don't look like they're it's, holding something. They're holding on to a bone that's oh, hanging. Are, yeah. yeah, they're trying to get, that's what's left of a deer leg, oh, okay. is that bone there. Uh, and then they're getting frustrated and rolling around and trying to like <laughs> MacGyver or really <laughs> Mission Impossible their way up the tree. I think that one is a sub-adult in this one too. This is a third individual. You see the white dots on its mate, like on the back of its head? That previous one did not have that. So this is three different individuals visiting the same bait site at about, the, I mean, there's a little bit of space if you look at the time signatures at the top when it's running. But this is probably a female with two sub-adults um, with it for this time of year. This is January 20th um, of last year. Um, she probably would not be hanging around with a male at that time of year. And the fact that there are two other ones, yeah, that's right. there were more images than I had to stop. This is like 400 images stitched together. So, um, but, but it's really fun to look through those. And you can see how like the image number stacks up when there's something in front of the camera. So speaking of other visitors, these are some of the other things that we caught on the cameras. Um, we got like a nice montane red fox carrying a hair. He doesn't even care about it. You can see this is the scent dispenser um, with the lure that drips down on the bone instead of having a bait. Um, we definitely get some black bears that can easily climb up there and help themselves. Um, and then the, the next picture over is a pine martin. And then, of course, we got a mountain lion that has no problem jumping up there and eating the bait, even though he's not supposed to. Uh, he doesn't know any better. Um, when there's more open country, um, when we set these in the fall or before we pick them up in the spring, we get things like wolves. That wolf happens to have a GPS collar and is somebody's research animal. You can see these, um, these spots get beaten up, especially when there's grizzly bears. That's the gun brushes. They've already been ripped off by the grizzly bears. So sometimes our collection gets uh, like you know ruined by someone else who visits the place and, and destroys our, our gear. Um, grizzly bears are also fun to watch in those sequences because they can't climb very well. Uh, so they'll get frustrated and, uh, and usually take it out on another grizzly bear if there's one there. So there's like lots of fighting going on, um, which is kind of fun to watch. And then our, our awesome, I can't even say how uh, hardcore these guys are. These are the four technicians that did most of our field work. So um, they posed at, in front of the camera when they went to collect it and then when I was going through processing pictures I got them I got to get pictures of them smiling and giving the thumbs up so that's uh, Houston Owen I got to give their names credit Colin and Autumn they are uh, double tough um, they they work really hard in the winter and, and they've got a lot of energy um, so with all of that data um, really great and in another five years we'll do it again and see where we're at um, and I'll tell you, um, even though Colorado didn't have any hits on their cameras that they set, their governor wants to reintroduce wolverines, along with, I'm sure you've heard more in the press that they're trying to reintroduce wolves in Colorado. But, um, wolverines is the other species that the governor would like to translocate from Canada, um, like live trap and move and release into Colorado. So either naturally or unnaturally, they might end up there and south of us, we'll see. Um, but all of this information helps us um, better manage the species. So those changes in their occupancy that we monitor over time helps us a lot. Um, it helps us direct research and it, you know, when you see them in front of the camera, it, really, like, it makes you think of other research questions and management questions and it, it just kind of drives the whole process of learning more about them. So all of that will help us with future conservation of this species. Abby has a question. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> is this such seen as a bear scientist? Uh, yeah, we have a whole bunch of bear scientists that work for us, and they just work on bears, and that is it. Sometimes I get very tired because they have to work with bears that are misbehaving and try to trap them and move them, and they work in the daytime and the nighttime. 
time and they are on call. So I used to do some stuff like that, but I don't have to get up in the middle of the night anymore. So unless I'm doing parent spotlight surveys, I'm gonna help all night. So but that's my choice. I know the thing bigger than the little green. What is it? A fish chair. They're about the same size. They're a little, there's a, like a little bit of crossover, but fishers are pretty cool too. We don't have very many of those in this part of the world, but Idaho does. Idaho Did you get phone to animal knowledge from the Who Would Win book? Okay. <laughs> 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 he probably can give me a run for my money. So, <laughs> but he, I mean, he might have to teach a lot of stuff. good info. Like yeah, that. yeah. But yeah, any other questions? Yes. Are they highly territorial or do they get along? Um, it depends on the time of year and it depends on the gender. Males are competitive and um, <laughs> if I went back to that um, that string of images that on the video, you'll see urine markings all around the base of that tree like this is mine. And then one will come and urinate over the top, nope, it's mine. And then they were rolling in it. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like lots of scent marking and um, they're pretty territorial except for during mating season then then they become tolerant of each other for, for certain reasons. But otherwise, not so much, yeah. And the, uh, the mothers will eventually, like once they're, once they're cubs or kids, people use those terms interchangeably for wolverines, um, once they mature and disperse, she'll become aggressive towards them and kick them out, and they'll have to find their own place to be, yeah. Some of that is kind of why I think we get these wolverines in weird places, because it's youngsters, just like the mountain lion that was in town, um, this last week is probably a young adult that just doesn't know where to be and they just start wandering until they find a habitat that's not like a space that's not occupied by another cat. Yeah. Yeah. So the status of wolverines, uh, their circumpolar yep. critter uh, in Scandinavia, Siberia is much known. Has, has it been studied? Uh, in Europe and uh, Yeah, Europe. most of our knowledge about the species comes from Scandinavia or Canada is where most of the work has been done. And, uh, and the baseline genetics work that's been done has been mostly for us in, on, on this side of the globe has, has come from Canada because it's still a trap species in a lot of places in that country because it's numerous enough there. Um, it gives us great information though um, and those are the folks that if places like Colorado want to live capture and translocate wolverines, they're probably going to come from Canada and the knowledge of how to trap and where to trap them is going to come from the trapping community because they're going to be the ones that have a pulse on that information. Yeah. As much as I'm not a huge fan of trapping myself, it's a wealth of information. Yeah. Have marking techniques been considered for um, in, like understanding range and movement? Like collaring? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, the one catch, so we have one collared wolverine right now in Wyoming. Um, and it was just kind of like a pilot test uh, that we just collared in March. Um, so we have a little bit of data on, it's a female. You can definitely tell where her den site is and where her cache sites are from all of the locations we've gotten from that. Um, we're crossing our fingers because wolverines are tube shaped. So putting a collar on them and keeping it on is really hard. They can, they can get that thing off if they really want to. And they're so strong. Um, that thing is on there kind of snug, which I'm not always happy about making an animal carry something that heavy and cumbersome around. I mean, the technology always gets better and better where they get lighter and more efficient, but it's usually in exchange for how much location data you can get off of it. Um, but there's been a lot of collaring studies, in, again, in Canada that look at, that's what gives us those home range sizes, is um, places that have higher numbers and, and better populations of wolverines than we do here have the ability to, to do those studies without, you know, like it being so inefficient trying to find individuals that it's just not cost effective. So that's where we get a lot of our 